You're listening to Family Talk, the radio broadcasting division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I am that James Dobson, and I'm so pleased that you've joined us today. Hello, and welcome to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and Family Talk is the listener-supported broadcast division of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. To learn more about the ministry and mission of Family Talk, visit drjamesdobson.org. Since creation, really, men have been tasked by God with the responsibility of fatherhood. We are to be accountable for raising our children on biblical principles and offering them godly counsel. Well, today on Family Talk, you're going to hear the first half of a conversation Dr. Dobson recorded a couple of years ago with author Jerry Newcomb. Dr. Newcomb is the executive director of the Providence Forum. He also serves as the senior producer, on-air host, and a columnist for D. James Kennedy Ministries. He has authored or co-authored 33 books, including What If Jesus Had Never Been Born?, A New Birth of Freedom, and The Unstoppable Jesus Christ. In fact, that last title will be the topic of Jerry's conversation with Dr. Dobson today. Jerry Newcomb holds a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in communication. He's also earned a doctorate of ministry as well. He and his wife, Christy, have two grown children and three grandchildren, and they make their home in South Florida. Let's join Dr. Dobson and his guest, Dr. Jerry Newcomb, right now on today's edition of Family Talk. With me in the studio today uh, is Dr. Jerry Newcomb. He's the author of a new book called The Unstoppable Jesus Christ, and he's written 29 books that I know of, uh, probably more than that. Uh, He is an award-winning TV producer for D. James Kennedy Ministries. Of course, Dr. Kennedy's gone on to heaven, but I tell you, he was the one of the finest men I ever met, and one that I consider to be a very close friend, and I miss him today. Um, but uh, Dr. Newcomb, in that capacity, uh, has been instrumental in producing over 71-hour TV programs. He has a master's degree from Wheaton College and a doctorate of ministry from Knox Theological Seminary. And he's an associate pastor at New Presbyterian Church in South Florida. He's been married to Kirsty for nearly 40 years. They have two children, two grandchildren, and one more on the way. Dr. Newcomb, thank you so much for joining us today. It is a real honor to be able to talk to you. Oh, well, thank you, and the honor is all mine. And it's uh, fascinating to me that this has been something I've wanted for years uh, and prayed about. You know, please, Lord, let me talk with Dr. Dobson sometime. Uh And uh, so it's a real blessing to do it. Actually, this is being recorded on the 38th wedding anniversary of my wife and me. Oh, my goodness. So 38 years ago, we said, yeah, I do, in a bilingual (laughs) service in Norway. Congratulations to you both. Thank you. Well, uh, you actually came and interviewed me on one occasion. I understand that it was about my dad, Mm -hmm. but I don't remember much of the detail. Well, it was in 1993 that I went there to Colorado Springs and I interviewed you. And basically the gist of the story was that you were going through as an adolescent or as a teenager, you were going through a bit of a rebellious period or at least a a difficult period. And your mother asked your father to consider, to reconsider his schedule because he had a schedule just chock full of all kinds of preaching assignments. And so what he ended up doing was curtailing a lot of those speaking assignments uh, to a great degree so that he could stay home and invest more in you while still, you know, doing ministry locally, but he was uh, not traveling on the road so he could invest time with you. And it really uh, paid off. And you even said in the interview that basically the ministry that God has launched through you with Focus on the Family and the Family Talking, all of the James Dobson ministries, uh, really were an outgrowth of your dad doing that. Your dad taking that time and investing like that, uh, you know, paid off in great spades for all of us. That's one of the reasons that I admire him so great and revere him. 
um, because uh, let me put some more flesh on those bones. Mm -hmm. I was 16. My dad was an evangelist, and he was gone a lot, and my mother raised me. And uh, that worked out pretty well until I got in my mid-teen years, and then I decided I knew more than she did. And uh, I I never really went into outbroken sin. I was a virgin when I got married, so was my wife Shirley, and uh, we really never did depart from our, our commitment to Christ. But I was starting uh, to run with the wrong crowd, and I had gone to a party one night. We didn't drink in those days, but um, I knew I shouldn't be there. And my mother drove by and saw it. And when I got home, she said, well, where'd you go tonight? And I told her. And she said, do you feel good about doing that? And I said, yes, not only do I feel good about it, but I'm going to do it again. And I'd never taken her on like that. And my mother was a great disciplinarian, but a very loving mother. And she just looked at me like she couldn't believe that I would defy her like that. And she said, well, I'm going to talk to your dad. And I said, you do that. And I went, uh, what she thought was into my room, but I went around the corner and I listened. And she called my dad, who was a thousand miles away, and she said only three words, I need you. My dad was the prominent evangelist in our denomination, and he was scheduled for four years uh, into the future. And uh, he was doing what he felt God called him to do. But he saw that he was needed at home. And he got on a train and came home. He canceled the entire slate of four years of meetings. And uh, he was uh, pretty emphatic about what happened when he got home. Uh, it's to my shock. I mean, I hadn't done anything really evil, but to my shock, my dad put a sign in the front yard that said, for sale. And the next thing I knew, our house was sold. My dad uh, took a pastorate so he could be at home with me. We went to a little town called San Benito, Texas, South Texas. And the next thing I knew, I was on a train heading south. And because of that commitment, uh, my dad pulled me back from the brink. Uh, I was heading in the wrong direction. The bridge was out. And he saw it, and my mom asked him simply to help her, and he came and gave me priority. We hunted, and we fished, and we reconnected, and um, I got even better acquainted with the man who was gone so much, and my life turned around, and I've really never had a problem with that kind of authority since. Um, but the important thing that I think I said to you the day you interviewed me was that my dad paid a price for that. Yeah. Um, by the time he went back into the evangelistic field when I graduated from high school, the, the younger men didn't know him. And some of the older men, his pastors, had forgotten him. And he really never achieved the prominence that he had before. But to my knowledge, he never looked back. And he did what he needed to do to save his son. And uh, I sit here today probably doing what I'm doing and what I've done for 44 years um, because that man cared enough to invest in me. And I tell you, that's a good man. And I, I hope the message uh, then when I talked to you before and even today uh, who are working too hard and gone too much and, you know, becoming successful men uh, will take another look at what matters most and give priority to those that depend on you at home. Yes. Oh, that's a terrific testimony. Even just to hear it again, it's amazing. And I understand when your dad died, uh, the, the, his tombstone reads, he prayed. That was he, his life. Yep. He asked for that on his footstone uh, because that was his life. He often prayed 
as much as three hours a day. Mm. And uh, he lived in the presence of the Lord. In the little town where he was first a pastor, tiny little Nazarene church, he was known as the man who had no leather on the toes of his shoes mm. uh, because he spent so much time on his knees uh, that he wore his shoes out, uh, the toes of his shoes before they uh, were worn out on the soles. And uh, that really did characterize him. And because of that, uh, he had a wonderful ministry, uh, but his most important convert, uh, at least from my point of view, was me. Yes. And his ministry continues to this very day it, in you. It does. I've written a lot about him. There's so many stories that I could tell, but this is your um, your day and your program, and I'm really interested in knowing how your teen years developed and how you got the call from the Lord. Well, I grew up in a, a traditional home and uh, it, church going and so forth, and when I went off to college, I... I'll be honest with you. I was looking for avenues to meet girls, and um, I tried different things, including even going to bars and so forth. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. But a friend invited me to a Bible study, and I didn't really know much about that. So I went to this Bible study, and I was uh, impressed by all the girls that were there. Mm -hmm. And I went back, you know, and and pretty soon I got to actually meet a lot of these people. And I don't mean, you know, the girls or whatever. I just mean lots of these nice people in this InterVarsity Christian Fellowship group uh, at Tulane University, which is where I went to undergraduate school. And and uh, after a while, I got really challenged to consider the claims of Jesus Christ. And I did some of my own research and, you know, ended up essentially committing my life to Jesus Christ. And that was back when I was a freshman in college at the age of 18. And it, it totally change the direction of my life. And then if you fast forward from that day or that time to about three years later, when I went off to Wheaton Graduate School, it was there in the registration line that I met my wife-to-be, who was uh, coming from Norway. And uh, so God provided me with a beautiful woman after all, and uh, she is my wife, and now we've been married 38 years. We have (laughs) two wonderful uh, children and two terrific grandchildren with one grandchild even on the way. When the Lord called you, and I assume it was a traditional call, you knew that the Lord was asking something from you. Is that correct? Uh, Yes. After It was, I'd say, pretty soon after I committed my life to Christ that I really did feel like I want to serve him in full-time capacity, what, you know, as opposed to becoming a business person or yeah. whatever. And obviously God has callings, different callings for different people, and we need great people yeah. in this calling and that calling and so forth. But I did feel early on in my Christian life that, yes, I want to serve the Lord full-time if I can. Did you resist that call? No, not really. No, I wanted to do it. I was just a matter of trying to figure out the best way to do it. And after I graduated from Wheaton grad school, I actually, I didn't even finish graduating. I still had to stay around and, you know, finish that up later after working. But I started working at Christian Radio, and I really kind of enjoyed it. In fact, I remember we used to put your programs on. And if I recall correctly, your program was 15 minutes a day, not 30. Yeah. And I remember when it went up to 30, and it was like, oh, this is good stuff. So I was working at a Christian radio station in the early 1980s in the Chicago area. And it opened my eyes as to just the incredible impact and ministry that uh, Christian radio can have and often really does have. And you've been a big part of that, as well as Chuck Swindoll and D. James Kennedy and... Uh, I've often thought about this. If England had the same kind of this day in and day out Christian broadcasting that you can get right there on your your local channels, I don't mean, you know, from shortwave radio or some other kind of uh, satellite or something like that, but just your regular channels. If these other countries, especially in Europe, if they had the same kind of ministry that we do in Christian radio, I'll bet you the results will be different. In other words, I'll bet you there'll be just a lot more 
uh, evangelism and evangelicalism, both uh, in Europe. I, I, th- I think Christian radio has played an incredible role, and of course, Christian TV as well. And I've been involved with that yes. with uh, Dr. Kennedy's ministry for 33 years now. Well, you know, I firmly believe that. Uh, in fact, I was in uh, London when the whole concept of Christian radio hit me, and I realized I could reach far more people uh, through that means. And at the time, I was at USC School of Medicine. I was enjoying what I was doing. But I saw the family starting to fall apart and felt like I ought to do something to uh, preserve it. And I resigned and started a little radio program, a little two-room office. I had no idea where that was going. And it just exploded. I mean, within five years, I had 400 employees and uh, just all kinds of things were happening. Um, But it uh, taught me what a tremendous medium radio and television are in reaching the gospel. Uh, You know, my dad, for all that I've told you about him being a prominent minister, he usually spoke to 200 people, 250 people, and nothing like uh, occurs in the megachurches today. And it's largely through the medium uh, of radio or television that has opened that field. And I have no doubt about the fact that the Lord drew me to it. You know, D. James Kennedy... Uh, who we've referenced, obviously, in this program before, he was reached as a young man through a radio broadcast. I'm sure you know the story, but the gist of it is is he uh, had no place in his life for God, and he was in his early 20s, and he was successful as a manager of an Arthur Murray dance studio. And whereas his radio had had some nice music on the night before, and Unfortunately, he was perhaps hung over or whatever on this Sunday morning, not going to church or anything like that. Uh, suddenly, the radio alarm went on, and instead of having this nice music, there was this preacher. And before he could bound out of bed and turn off the preacher, the preacher said something on the radio that grabbed Dr. Kennedy's attention. And he said, suppose you were to die, and then you stood before God, and then God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What right would you have to enter into my heaven? What would be your answer? And Dr. Kennedy thought, well, that's an important question because I'm, I'm going to die. We're all going to die one day. And if this is true, you know, what would be the answer to that? And he ended up listening. And at first he didn't agree with the fellow. And then he went to a local newsstand. This was back in the early 50s. And he said, tell me, do you have any religious books here? And Dr. Kennedy said when I interviewed him about this one time, he said, oh, I shudder to think now what I could have received. But Mm -hmm. the fellow did have a copy of The Greatest Story Ever Told. He said he got that book, he read it, and by the end of the week, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And the rest is history. But it shows how incredible Christian broadcasting can be in whatever outlet you can, you know, uh, have it get out to. You know, Jerry, uh, you'll recall that I was uh, given the honor, one of the highest honors I've ever had, of uh, preaching. I'm not a preacher, but I had the the honor of speaking uh, at Jim Kennedy's funeral. And I talked about what you just said and the version of it that I heard and that I said that day was that he originally said no to the call of uh, the ministry and fought it because he wanted to be a dance teacher. Can you believe that? (laughs) I mean, here's a guy with all this talent in the world, and he now knows what God wants him to do, and he resisted it, I guess, for a year or two. And then finally, when he yielded, look what the man did. I mean, the, the... Evangelism explosion alone is one of the divisions of his ministry. Mm -hmm. Uh, The last I heard had uh, resulted in six million people coming to Christ. It's probably much greater now. Yes. And and, uh, all because uh, he he yielded. Uh, But uh, I want to say to the young people who are out there, if God is calling you into full-time ministry— You dare not turn him down. Amen. You're absolutely right. Boy, I I totally agree. And you know what? At the end of the day, it is so 
fulfilling. I mean, I don't know that there's anything more joyful to experience than to be used by the Lord, to actually do something where you feel like, you know, this impacts somebody, impacts somebody's yeah. life for the gospel. And uh, as you were saying earlier at the very outset of this whole program, there's incredible spiritual battle that we're in where, you know, it's uh, Satan is it's as if he's pulling out all the stops. But as Jesus said, and you quoted him, you know, he is, uh, we should not fear because he has overcome. In fact, if I could, real fast, uh, the, the <laughs> book that I, I wrote here called The Unstoppable Jesus Christ, the original title was The Unstoppable Jesus Christ. And if I could explain the story real fast, uh, I just thought you might find this interesting because it's that same kind of that anti-Christian spirit that is so pervasive. There was a college class a few years ago that I write about in this book where the, the professor said, OK, everybody, take out a sheet of paper and write the name Jesus on this paper. Now, put the paper on the floor, get up and stomp on the paper. In other words, stomp on Jesus. Well, there was one student in the class who said, no, I'm not going to do that. And then he got out of the class and kind of basically told the world what this professor had, had uh, you know, has signed people to do and how boneheaded it was. And uh, that made me think about, you know, the unstoppable Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that was the working title of this book. But then I thought, well, most people aren't going to know what it means. But uh, I gave one example after another where, you know, frankly, we know that Jesus is going to win. And sometimes it seems that that is not so. Sometimes it seems like the other side is winning. But uh, as Bill Buckley put it one time when he he actually introduced a Christian debate between a Christian and a skeptic about 15 years ago. And he said in the very introduction, he said, if during the course of this debate, the skeptic disappears in a puff of smoke, then reckon that Jesus up in heaven has just cleared his throat. Mm. And I thought, oh, wow, that's, that's so true. We need to put all this stuff in perspective. The spiritual battle is there. It's very real. Evil is very pervasive and has made incredible inroads in our culture. But at the end of the day, uh, we know that God is on our side and that we should be uh, striving to do what George Washington said, our first president. He said, Unless we imitate Christ, whom we call the divine author of our blessed religion, we can never hope to be a happy nation. And when you think about it, you know, are we imitating Christ as a nation? No. Are we a happy nation? No. <laughs> but but we would be if we uh, imitated Jesus. Boy, um, Jerry, I really enjoyed talking to you today, and I uh, uh, wish we could do it again. Can you give us another day? Sure. Uh, there's so much we have in common, and we see things the same way. And I've heard of you and the things that you've done for a long time. And now this book, The Unstoppable Jesus Christ, uh, I paused when I saw that title, and I wondered about it. And I see now what you were uh, getting at. And uh, we need to talk more about the culture in your book. Let's do that next time, if you will. Okay, great. Thank you. God bless you, friend. Thanks for the wonderful work that you do. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Family Talk, and that was part one of Dr. Dobson's conversation with author and radio host Jerry Newcomb. You can learn more about Dr. Newcomb, his role at D. James Kennedy Ministries, his books, and more when you visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash Family Talk. You know, our core mission here at the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute is to encourage and strengthen the institution of the family. One way we strive to fulfill this mission is through Dr. Dobson's monthly newsletter. It always has encouraging words and biblical analysis of the most pressing current events. Now, you can request a physical mailed copy of the newsletter, or we'll send you one through email. Either way, contact us by calling 877-732-6825 with your request. That's 877-732-6825. Or you can make your request known online when you go to drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org to request Dr. Dobson's free monthly newsletter. 
Well, thanks again for listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk today. We couldn't do what we do without your prayers and your faithful financial support. I'm Roger Marsh. Hope you'll join us again tomorrow for the conclusion of Dr. Dobson's fascinating and helpful conversation with Dr. Jerry Newcomb. Until then, may God continue to richly bless you and your family. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning into our program today. You may know that Family Talk is a listener-supported program, and we remain on the air by your generosity, literally. If you can help us financially, we would certainly appreciate it. God's blessings to you all.